Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Barth, in case you were wondering. Um, and uh, here with my, my wife, Wendy Kopp. You guys are in for a treat. Last night, uh, when we were preparing for coming down here today, we live in New York City together. I looked at the, the package of information uh, that was so nicely done to prepare us. And it said, um, we understand the two of you have done this many times together. Um, and I'm here to tell you, we've actually never done this together. We actually, you're the first people to see us uh, share a little bit about um, our journey the last 20 years, our reflections and takeaways. So um, hope you enjoy it. It's the first time, hopefully not the last. And turn it over to my lovely wife, Wendy. <laughs> um, so I got started in this a little over 20 years ago when I was a senior in college at Princeton University. And you know, I was part of what they thought of then as the me generation. Um, supposedly, we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street and make a lot of money. Um, and I felt like that label was just misplaced. I felt like I was one of thousands of graduating seniors in our country who were just searching for a way to assume a significant responsibility right out of college that would make a real difference in the world. Um, and I had become very focused as just a concerned college student and a public, public policy major about the inequities that persist in our country in the quality of education. Um, you know, here we are, a country that aspires so admirably to be a place of equal opportunity, um, and yet still today where kids are born really determines their educational prospects and in turn life prospects. Um, well, one day I got this sense, as I said, that you know, the problem wasn't our generation. The problem was with the recruiters. You know, All the recruiters who were looking for us liberal arts graduates um, were investment banks and management consulting firms and other corporations asking us to commit two years to go work in their firms. And one day I just thought, you know, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in our country's highest poverty communities as we were being recruited at the time to work on Wall Street. And I thought it would make a huge difference in, in the immediate term for kids growing up today to channel all of this talent and energy that was good enough for those firms on Wall Street, but into classrooms in our most under-resourced communities. And at the same time, I thought, you know, how powerful would this be um, for the priorities of a generation of leaders to have their first experience out of college be teaching in, in, in urban and rural public schools rather than, than working on Wall Street. It was one of those ideas, um, I think, I mean, I needed a thesis topic and decided to propose it in my thesis, um, but it was one of those ideas that was clearly just meant to happen and, and was very quickly far beyond me and, and just magnetized you know, hundreds and, and thousands of people who came together uh, to ultimately make it happen. And, and I got roped into this as one of those, those early uh, folks getting, getting excited about what's possible. I, was, I graduated from college in 1989. I was traveling in Europe. And uh, lo and behold, my mother reads probably the first little article ever written about Teach for America in the New York Times, uh, tapes it, keep, keeps it. And when I come back around New Year's of 1990, I saw, I read about this, this young person who was the same age as myself starting this National Teacher Corps. Went in, interviewed Wendy, um, and two weeks later, I'm on the road. Um, we were a band of us, the first group that were hired, uh, given donated rental cars from Hertz. I was given most of the East Coast, and we were told, go out and recruit college seniors uh, to make this commitment. And uh, it was a true startup. We'd hit the campuses in the morning. Sometimes they knew we were coming. Many times they didn't. And uh, this is pre-internet era. We're putting up posters. We're panning out flyers with the aspiration being that at the end of the day, we'd have an information session and someone would show up. And lo and behold, again and again, you'd have 20, 30, and 40 seniors at outstanding colleges across the country showing up to hear about this idea called Teach for America without very little information to go on. I mean, literally, they would ask us questions at that point like, where will we teach? And we'd say, we don't know. <laughs> and they'd say, how will you train us? And we'd say, we're going to figure that out. And they'd say, you know, how does this all get funded? And we said, well, we're working on it. That's what Wendy does. And, um, and 2,500 seniors who were talking to people who were, you know, nine months older than them, asking them to take a leap of faith. And what was then, again, considered the me generation of all times uh, decided to apply to Teach for America. That all happened between January and March of 1990. 
the prevailing notion in our country, uh, backed up by all the research at the time, was that socioeconomic background predicted educational outcomes. Um, today, we know that that does not need to be the case, as our predecessor here on this stage uh, you know, made clear. I think the first indications for me um, came from really in the hands of some of our teachers. The fact is that the first 500 teachers went out, started teaching in the most challenging of circumstances. And honestly, they went in incredibly committed and idealistic, but they hit a wall um, because they saw kids facing our country's most, you know, the most extreme social challenges we have to, to offer um, who were in schools that in no way had the kind of extra supports and extra capacity to meet their needs. And as a result, you know, if you're a teacher in that situation, it starts seeming pretty hopeless. But some small fraction of them, Mike Feinberg among the initial group, um, started showing us what was possible. Um, and still to this day, you know, I take so much of, of my inspiration um, from those among our teachers who are, in fact, putting their kids on a completely different trajectory. Um, I just published a book called A Chance to Make History, and it takes its title uh, from one of our teachers, whose name is Megan Brousseau, who just finished her two years teaching in the Bronx last year. She walked into her four classes of 112 ninth graders in the Bronx um, and said to them, this is your chance to make history. These are kids who, almost all of them, were learning or had learned English as a second language. 20% of them were more than three years behind in their reading levels. They had had very little exposure to science before she got them, and she's supposed to teach them you know, ninth grade biology. Mm -hmm. And she decided to call upon them to take and pass the New York State Regents exam, a rigorous exam in biology. This is something few students in the Bronx do. Many students aren't even allowed to sit for the exam, and then when they take it, many, many don't pass. Um, but she charged them with that goal. And um, through an extraordinary act of leadership, um, and, and through lots and lots of hard work on the part of her students, she blew that goal away. All of her kids, 112 of them, took and passed that test, and they did so at a 9% higher average passing rate than the average New York City-wide passing rate, which includes all the specialized <laughs> schools. <laughs> so what Megan shows us is what is possible. You know, I mean, she shows us that when kids who face lots of extra challenges, are met with high expectations and extra supports, they can excel and excel on an absolute scale. There's something incredibly hopeful, incredibly motivating about that. There's something else about her example, though. And she, as, as an example of all the other hundreds of folks uh, like her who I've met, there are only so many Megans in the world. And the fact is that in order to accomplish that goal, Megan went to just extraordinary lengths. She operated like the most effective leaders I've ever met operate in that, you know, she did what a great leader does. You know, she walked into her class, she said, here's the vision, you know, by the end of the year, here's where we're going to be. She then went to such extents to motivate her kids to work harder than they'd ever worked before to get there. She convinced them that if they worked hard enough, in fact, they would be able to do that, that that would matter in their life. She woke up every day and made 15 wake-up calls to get her kids to school. She did so many things to get her kids working with her. And then the extent to which she worked such hours outside of the classroom to make sure that she was maximizing every second she had with the kids. When I spent time in her classroom, there was a sense of urgency, like every second was maximized to move the kids forward. And then she realized she wasn't going to have enough time, so she figured out how to get her kids there at 7, how to keep them till 6, how to get 75% of them to come to school every Saturday in order to pull it off. So. Well, there's something, I mean, she's showing us what's possible. There's something also very daunting. And, and what you learn from the Megans of the world is this is actually not the answer. We're not going to ensure that all kids in our country attain an excellent education but through tens of thousands of, of Megans because there are not tens of thousands of Megans. Um, thankfully, though, what we've also learned over the last 20 years is that we can build schools that make it never easy 
but certainly easier for talented, committed teachers, but not absolute superheroes, um, to meet the needs of their kids and attain those, those same results. And, and you all got to, to meet Mike Feinberg, one of the two co-founders of KIPP, just, just before we joined the stage. And, and you know, hopefully, if anything, one of the things you take away from Mike's story is that we can see not just a real sense of possibility based on what individual teachers are doing, but that actually whole schools are putting children growing up in the most challenging situations in America on an even playing field with kids growing up in more affluent communities. Again, just the facts that you're hearing today, 82% of children in America from the top quartile economically complete college. 82% from the top quartile, not the top 1%, not the top 5%, but the top 25% economically. 8% of children growing up in the lowest income quartile finish college in America. So we have a 10x gap. And what Mike shared with you is this idea that he and Dave had, which is if we make promises to kids, and if we do the things Megan does, not just in fifth grade, but in fifth through eighth grade, what kind of outcomes could we have? And with, with our first two schools, we began to see that you could actually have children starting two and three grade levels behind their peers in affluent communities, and in four years, be caught up to them, if not ahead. But then that raised the next question that Mike shared with us, which is, if you could do it twice, once in Houston and once in the Bronx, could you do it again and again? Could you do it in communities all across the country, rural and urban? And over the last decade, that's really what the KIPP Foundation, working with communities across the country, has been trying to demonstrate, that we can do this again and again, that we can go from two schools to 10 schools to 20 schools and now 99 schools. We do it in all the ways Mike described. If you go to KIPP schools, you will see our kids are going to school from 7.30 to 5. You will see kids going to school during the summer. You'll see that they are working harder as students. You'll see that they are doing more homework. If you really wanted to get a sense, though, for what is going on from the standpoint of being able to scale a school culture again and again, if you traveled with me for one month across the country and we sat down with first grade Kipsters and eighth grade Kipsters, and if we sat down with parents of fifth grade Kipsters and ninth and tenth grade Kipsters, and we sat down with our teachers, and you asked them, tell me what this school is about. Yes, it's more time. Yes, it's great teaching and more of it. Every single child, every single teacher, every single parent would tell you, this school is about a mission, to climb the mountain to and through college. It's the first thing they will tell you. And they will tell you there are no shortcuts. I know I'm going to have to work really hard in order to make that climb. And they'll tell you, but I can do it because I'm part of a bigger team and family. And they'll tell you, I also know uh, that I can do it in a way that's not just about working hard, but also being nice. And we've done that now 99 times. You'll hear those same answers whether you're talking to a five-year-old or a 16-year-old. So we no longer have a question of whether this effort can be replicated. But what's even more interesting now in terms of what we know is not just that this can be done 99 times within our network, but that the basic principles at work are beginning to take root in cities across the country, where people are saying, you know, what's possible if instead of thinking about our school districts as big systems controlling the future of all children, we think about how we create schools aligned around a common mission. So clear, this mission is preparing our kids for their climb to and through college. Provide those schools, ensure those schools are led by outstanding individuals. That the biggest lever of change then is making sure you've got an outstanding school principal who rallies and inspires other adults to join them. And then is given the freedoms to pursue that mission in whatever way it takes to get there with unbelievable close attention to management of everything that goes on in the building. Very clear aligned mission, empowered leadership at the school level, and then everyone in the school, teachers and students aligned around what it's gonna to take to get there. This is what's happened 99 times. It's not only happened at KIPP, we now have several hundred examples of schools just like ours, if not better, in communities across the country. And we're beginning to see, just beginning to see in cities like New York, like New Orleans, like Washington, D.C., individual schools not just do this for three and 400 kids, but five, 10, 15, or 20% of the children in those cities have an opportunity to go to a school that will provide them with a fundamentally transformative education. The question right now is not whether it can be done on a school level. That's being answered. That's been answered in the last decade. The question is, how can we provide this opportunity for far greater numbers of children growing up in poverty in America? 
So we know something today that we didn't know 20 years ago is, is the bottom line. Like we know that we can provide kids who face all the challenges of poverty with an education that is transformational for them. Um, we're focused on two uh, sort of interventions that we deeply believe are fundamental to the whole as we think about, okay, so what is it gonna take now to ensure that 20 years from now, we've actually moved the needle in a major way against the achievement gap in, in its aggregate sense. Um, and, and we'll just each say a bit about what we're focused on. Um, so, you know, if you look at the last 20 years in this, and you look at what's happening in classrooms like Megan's, in schools like the KIPP Academies and, and other very high performing, both charter schools and traditional schools that are bringing many of their same practices inside the regular system, in the, at the school systems that are changing, at the policies that are changing, if we look hard and honestly, one thing we will see is that wherever there is transformational change for kids, not just incremental change, and, and we simply have to realize that incremental change is not gonna do it. In our low-income communities, we are consistently graduating more of our kids into the prison system than into college. We need meaningful, life-changing changes like those that we see in, in these KIPP academies. Um, so how do we get that? Wherever we see transformational change, we see a transformational leader at the center of it. And by that, I mean someone who, I mean, in Megan's case, you know, she went in at the classroom level. She believed so deeply in her kids that she decided she did not have an option. She actually told me, I wish she was standing here because she would go from superhero to, oh, that's just a normal person. She really agonized over whether she should walk into that classroom and set such a big, you know, audacious goal because she was terrified. She's 22 and she didn't know if she could pull it off and she didn't want to set her students up to fail. But she realized, and she, you know, in setting this goal, she said to me, you know what, I just realized at the end of the day, I thought about the stakes for my kids and realized I better do it because the alternative was not gonna end well for my kids. And what we see when we look at these schools and at the school systems that are changing, and the policies that are changing, you know, always there's a leader in the center of those equations who know what Megan knows, who have more often than not had the completely transformational experience themselves of having taught successfully in an urban or rural school, who deeply know, no one will ever shake Megan from the conviction that her kids can do this. She knows this is not a problem that we have because the kids aren't motivated and their parents don't care, but rather because they truly have not been given the opportunities they deserve. And she also, has a very grounded understanding of what it takes to set her kids up for success. No one will ever convince her that any one thing, that there's any shortcut, that giving every kid a computer or just making sure all the schools are small or just fixing all the teachers tomorrow, like no one thing. She deeply knows that this is a, you know, both easy but also complicated answer in terms of, of what it's gonna take to set her kids up. It's the people with Megan's kind of foundational experiences, perspectives, her conviction, her determination, who go off and start these very high performing schools and chart a different path, who you know, work in the New Orleanses and Washington DCs and New York cities of the world to say, we gotta re-engineer this system, who will go out as 32 year old state legislators in the state of Colorado and say, you know what, we gotta come together around a different system for you know, empowering principals to determine who the teachers are in their buildings. Um, so it's, it's observing that, that you know, fuels our, our urgency at Teach for America um, to become much bigger and, and much better. Our mission is to build the force of transformational leaders um, by going out on these college campuses. You know, today, this year, 48,000 graduating seniors applied to Teach for America, 18% of Harvard senior class, 27% of Spelman senior class, you know, competed to teach um, in, in our urban and rural schools. 
Um, we invest a great deal in them to try to ensure that many more of them have the level of success that Megan had, which is so critical for their kids and also completely critical for ensuring that they learn the right lessons and gain the foundation that will enable a whole lifetime of educational advocacy and educational leadership. Um, and, and then we know there's a lot more we can do to basically accelerate these folks' as leadership so that many more of them move into school principalships and district leadership, into starting advocacy organizations and moving into policy, running for elected office, starting social enterprises earlier than they otherwise would. Um, so that's what Teach for America is working to do. We've just charted a plan to, you know, we have 8,000 teachers out there right now across 40 communities. We have 20,000 alums. Um, and we believe it should be possible. There's still a big if. We need tons of help in order to make it happen. But we're trying to basically double while getting much better at what we do in the next five years so that we have 15 thousand folks out there, about 20 to 25 percent of the new hires across 60 communities, and in that time we'll double the force of Teach for America alums out there who are, again, at the center of so much of the kind of larger changes that are happening um, right now. And uh, for us, I thought I'd just maybe leave you with, with a, a picture of, of how we think about what's possible in one more generation, what we could potentially accomplish, um, all of us together, working together. What we see potentially is our role, KIPP, is one, one part of, of helping us move to that. And then maybe leave you with two stories that um, hopefully inspire you all to, re to recognize that everyone, absolutely everyone in this room, can play a part in, in moving us towards that day. So um, I shared with you, I think, a sense of what we're seeing happen on the ground in some cities across the country. Um, right near where Wendy and I live, we have four children. We live in an apartment in, in Manhattan. They, all our kids live in one bedroom. They get along. It's a perfect, perfect picture you can imagine. Um, <laughs> we, live about, we live about 15 blocks, uh, I guess maybe a little less than that, from Harlem. If uh, you looked at public school options in Harlem one generation ago, tw 20 years ago, there was not one good public school in Harlem, not one. Not one that anyone in this room would send your own child or grandchild to, not one. One generation later, there are, it depends on you know, who you get into a debate with, but there are no less than 10 great public schools in Harlem. Absolutely great. Schools that you would go into and say, this is really, really impressive. This is phenomenal teaching. This is a great place for kids. Like schools that would be much stronger schools than the ones where we send our own kids. That, that is, that is good. How, then, how good they've gotten. And you look at this in, in what was the lowest performing um, neighborhood in the city of New York from a, from a school standpoint, and you recognize what's happened is um, you've had a concentration of, of energy where people have said, we're going to bring in a lot of people to open new schools. Outstanding talent, committed to doing, what's take, doing what it takes, attracting the teachers who want to work in those kind of schools. And as a result, you get to a point in 10 years where last year, they had a parent fair in Harlem for parents to think about where they wanted to send their children. These are public schools. And they had over 3,000 families come to a parent fair to choose where they want to send their child. And it makes people wonder, well, what was going on 10 years ago? Did the parents all get smarter? Did we just get a lot of smart parents? Is that what happened? The, the reality is we absolutely changed the way we think about options for children in an urban, in this case, in an urban setting, where we no longer think the key is to have one big district system managing everything for everyone, making all the decisions, and essentially saying this is the right school for your child, but you're creating a world in which there are lots of options for kids, public options. The district sets a very clear bar for what, how we measure performance, and then is allowing truly um, entrepreneurship to flourish and new opportunities for kids to be created. KIPP is just one of them. We're, we're, only, we're only two of these 10 schools in Harlem. You're seeing the same kind of energy in New Orleans, where a district pre-Katrina, a city, was literally, if it had to be probably the lowest performing system of schools ever in America if you went into public schools pre-Katrina. If you look at it today, dramatic revolution. 60 to 70% of those schools are schools that are really either putting kids on a level playing field or on path to being able to do that. This is what's possible. In one generation, our, our grandkids could grow up in cities where there's not just one choice of school, but actually there's lots of great school options, public school options, 
for children who can then pursue, pursue their dreams. For KIPP, our role in hope, hopefully helping keep pushing us this way is to double in size again in the next five years. It's taken us 16 years to get to 27,000 kids this year. We think in the next five years we can get to nearly 60,000 children. We can double the number of schools. And we can go from having 1,000 KIPPsters, or that's our alums, in college to over 10,000. There are challenges to pulling this off. We keep learning what it takes to do this, and then we discover there's a new challenge. Um, one challenge is we're going to have to find partners in higher education. 85% of our eighth graders to date have gone to college. 95% of ninth, eighth graders have graduated from high school. But if nothing changes, less than 40% of our kids will graduate from college. We're going to need to have higher ed step up to the plate with us and say we're committed not just to seeing first generation kids of color start college, but we want to see them finish. So for any of you, for all of you who've got connections to higher education, your alma maters, there's a big opportunity to ask the question, what are you doing to be part of the solution providing new opportunities for this next generation of children? The second thing I would just leave you with is that as much as more signs of success are, are abound. And when he describes so many of the great things that are going on well beyond certainly what we're doing, just so many great examples, the more success there is, <coughs> the more pressure there is, and sometimes pushback. And this is, this is work that involves people deciding to put their, their own name and energy and personal connections on the line to make sure we keep put, keeping the pressure on in these communities. It can get very political. And so I think as much as there's a lot of science to say we should be able to move and double in size easily in the communities we serve. We're prepared for the fact that getting from one to five schools in many of these cities may have been much easier than going from five to 10. It's an area where people really can make a difference. I'll leave you with two stories just in terms of thinking about you know, solutions and what, could, what, what this can mean, mean for you. Um, we just, uh, last week, secured a 10-year contract to be able to run our schools in Baltimore. We've been running schools in Baltimore for eight years. We have an elementary school and a middle school. They're the highest performing schools in that city. Our eighth graders in inner city Baltimore typically score in the top five of all middle school kids in the state of Maryland. And yet, <laughs> and yet we were literally on life support up until a week ago as to whether we could exist beyond a year-to-year -year basis. And through a lot of a lot of hard work, willingness to potentially go into the legislature and try to pass a bill, we achieved a 10-year lifeline. And it happened because two board members who in their day jobs are, are managing money, self-made people who have got more than enough going on with their own family decided they were going to get on our board and they were going to make sure we were successful in this fight. These aren't people who had to do it. These aren't people who have lots of free time. They chose to make this their mission over the last 24 months. This victory last week was due in large part to their unbelievable commitment behind our leadership team on the ground. Second story I'll, just, I'll leave you with when you think about what can you do to be part of it. And I often share this story. Um, Wendy and I were both you know, incredibly close with, with Don Fisher, who Mike showed a picture of Don and Doris Fisher. Don had founded The Gap, um, an incredible American business retailing icon. Uh, Don liked to make big bets on ed reform and stick with them. Huge supporter of Teach for America. Created the KIPP Foundation. And um, I think about what he did when he decided to get into education reform. And obviously, he had tremendous resources, un, un, you know, unequaled energy. But he was 69 years old when he decided to get into ed reform. He was 69. And in 11 years before he passed away, he basically drove Teach for America's growth three or four times. Not just, well, with money, but also with challenging. Created the KIPP network to say to Mike and Dave, this can't be two schools. This is too good. we got to grow it. And his biggest regret in life was to have to go when he did, because he said, this is just too much fun. He had never had more fun. He said, my, my life has been the gap, my family, and this work. It really is an opportunity not just to make a huge difference at a critical juncture in our country's history, but actually to have a ton of fun if you choose to get involved. That's great.
I should let that be the last word, but I'm looking here and we have one minute and 30 seconds left. And I would just say in sum that, you know, the most salient lesson we've learned in the last 20 years in this, um, just to say it again, is that we can solve this problem. You know, it's the most fundamental problem in our country. It's the thing that keeps us from fulfilling the ideals of our nation. Um, and truly, we can do it. Not only do we see evidence that it's possible to do it, but when you get underneath it all, you realize there's no magic to this. There's nothing elusive about it. This is about, you know, very determined leaders setting out to do it and going to great extents, you know, literally invest in the same kind of energy and discipline that we would put into reaching any ambitious goal. And so I think there's something truly motivating about that. Um, it's not a question any longer of whether we can. It is truly a question of whether we will. And I really believe, I mean, the answer to that question lies in the answer to the question of whether enough of our country's future leaders, our college students, will step up and say, yes, I want this to be my pursuit, they think initially just for two years, but you know they soon learn otherwise and never really leave. Um, and whether enough people like the, the folks in this room will step up and say, as Don Fisher did, you know what, we're going to make it happen. Um, so thank you for considering um, becoming all the more you know, committed to the cause. So thanks. <laughs>